Look at that everyone. That is a Tasmanian tiger. I'm so excited. I'm here with Bethany Palumbo, who's a conservator at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. For Australians, this is a really iconic animal. And it's sad in a way, this is like our icon of extinction. This rare film is of the last Tasmanian tiger in existence, just before its death in 1933. Despite unconfirmed reports, we'll probably never see another. What can you tell me about this? I, I don't even know where to start. You just have to start talking because I'm okay. so excited. This specimen, um, we believe, came to the museum in 1910. It was a gift from the Royal Society of Tasmania. Um, when it arrived in the museum, it went on display where it stayed for a long time. And then since then, it's been in storage. There's a, quite a few conservation issues with the specimen. When we found it in storage, it was really dusty and dirty. And there was a lot of surface dirt that had stuck to the fur. There's also quite a few areas of restoration, which has been done at an undisclosed time with unknown materials. How about you take me on a little tour then of yeah. this thylacine and you show me some of the things that you're unhappy with. Okay. The purpose of conservation isn't necessarily to make things look brand new. Something of this rarity and the fact that it's an extinct animal, my priority would be to just preserve it in its most pure form. These fills here, these dark areas of grey, this appears to be some sort of introduced hard matter that has then been painted over. And this could be disguising natural pigmentation, even the natural skin underneath. So it would be my priority to remove that. Do you find that a lot of your job is undoing mistakes of the past? Sometimes, yeah, yeah. And then occasionally you get to fix something up and make it look spanking new. So there's, there's lots of different, in conservation, there's lots of different levels of treatment depending on the history and scientific significance. The stripes are also fake. Oh, I tell you that? no, you yeah. haven't. I can tell when acrylic paint has been used because the texture of the hair becomes very dull. You can probably feel it too through your glove. Here's very soft and then you move into the stripe and it kind of squeaks. And then just to test this theory, you can try a little bit of acetone. Find a little spot that's not going to be too obvious, maybe down here. Mm. Yeah, you can see yeah. it going off. So in this case, acrylic paint was very popular around the 50s and 60s. So they would have thought, oh, this doesn't look enough like a Tasmanian tiger. It needs better stripes yeah. and just painted them on. Yeah, and these stripes, these fake stripes could potentially be over areas of real pigmentation, which would be valuable for us to know for research. So what are you going to do? Are you going to de-stripe it? I'm tempted to, yeah. It will involve discussions between myself and the collections manager hmm. um, as to what the priorities of treatment are. I don't know what to say. I won't take away any of its value. I think it would add more value if it was in its purest form. Even if it doesn't look tigerish anymore. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. Part of me thinks. Part of me. I, th I don't. I don't want to strip you of any, no. of any of your heritage by removing the stripes of this. No, no, no. Like, like the, if, they're, if they're not real, they should come off. I'm just wondering if, when you well, take them off, we will see any evidence of the original one. Potentially, ones. yeah. There could be natural pigment still in there. Usually, for taxidermy, the teeth and jaw. Um, are preserved and put in, so these are the original teeth. And then all of the soft tissue is fake, so things like the tongue, the nose, and the eyes are made out of glass. These ones are just generically dark, which one could assume is very lifelike. This is not the only thylacine in the collection here at this museum? No, we have 16 specimens in our collection. 16? 16, 16 one yeah. One six? Yeah, one of 101 taxidermy specimens in the world. There's 101? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then we have 16 here. This is the only taxidermy preserved one. There are others preserved in fluid. Um, or we have a collection of uh, skeletal materials and furs. So some of them are just fur and bones, and you have some in, in liquid? Yeah, preserved, fluid preserved in alcohol. We've got a book here as well. What have you got in the book? Oh, uh, yeah, so I found this in the library. This is a collection of our annual reports from the early 20th century. And here you can see it's listed. The following specimens have been prepared and exhibited in the court during the past year. Are these old documents useful to you as a conservator? Yeah, very useful because you also want to verify what's on the label right. to make sure that the two sources match and that we know that this is the true date that it arrived and therefore that's the true age of the specimen. Once you've possibly de-striped it, possibly, <laughs> and you've given it a clean and you've decided what you're going to do about the patches and the holes and things like that, what do you do at the end? Do you like, do you do anything to jazz it up or do you just make sure, okay, it's stable. We'll do a condition assessment before we do any treatment and take lots of photographs. And then after treatment's been conducted, we'll also do another assessment 
and take more photographs mm -hmm. as a document of the treatment that you've done. So you don't end up with a situation like this where there's restoration undertaken with no indication of when or where or how. Okay, and in case you're wondering where they do these photo shoots, have a look. There's a, there's a fox having a photo shoot as we speak. Oh. Look at that. Now, two final things I want to bring up. One is I notice on the sign it says Tasmanian wolf, not Tasmanian tiger. No idea. No I idea? know that they called them tigers based on their stripes. It was more of a nickname, but I have no idea where the wolf part came into it. And one last thing, you probably heard a brief mention earlier that there are actually specimens of the thylacine here at the museum that are preserved in liquid. You want to see those, don't you? You want to see them? Can we see them? Of course we can see them. It mm. would be my pleasure. All right. So we've come down to the vertebrate fluid store. Believe it or not, this is one of the thylacines stored here in liquid. It's sort of not in one piece, is it? No, so this one looks like it was quite well worked before it was put into fluid. Yeah. Um, the fluid it's contained in is alcohol. Yeah. This will be about 70%. And the discoloration you can see, the orangey colour is that's just natural fats that have secreted out of the specimen. And here's the second one stored. Is this again in alcohol, Beth? Yep, this will be in alcohol. I mean, this one looks a bit more like a creature. How is this useful now that it's stored here in alcohol? Um, so specimens stored in alcohol have value in that you can extract DNA from them. And also in that the anatomy here is very much as it was in life. But if I was a scientist and I came in here and wanted to study the anatomy and said, oh, I want to learn a bit more about the bones and things like that, what would I do? Do I take it out yeah, of the alcohol? We can remove it from alcohol. It can be out of alcohol probably for a day or so before we'd have to put it back. But everything in this collection is accessible to researchers. You can see there's interesting claw marks here where he's tried to escape <laughs> at night when everything comes to life. <laughs> is this the story you tell the kids, is yeah. it? Yeah, and they're like, whoa! <laughs> Blows their minds. <laughs> Careful, some people are going to think you're serious. <laughs> this episode was supported by 23andMe, the online genetic service that can teach you what the 23 chromosomes that make up your DNA can teach you about your ancestry, traits and health. To help with scientific discoveries and learn your own personal DNA story, go to 23andMe.com slash objectivity.